Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, a man that puts his pants on two legs at a time. He is the captain. I think that's supposed to read three legs at a time if you get my drift. It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are drinking Grapefruit Double IPA by the hardworking men and women over at Claremont Craft Ales. Garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a double IPA, so if you're like me and you like to get all hopped up, well, there are plenty of hops in here. The grapefruit smooths it out quite a bit, making this a strong but still yet quite refreshing beer, perfect for summertime. And Grapefruit Double IPA was brought to us by this batch of summertime buddies. First up, we have Carissa in Milford, Connecticut. And a big shout out to Holly in Walnut Creek, California. Next up, we give a cheers to Julia in Salome, Arizona. And a big We Like Your Jib to Abigail in Wheaton, Illinois. And cheers to my friends Zach, Lauren, and Amanda. Strong, strong members of the True Crime Garage Army stationed in Logan, Utah. And last but not least, a big Texas shout out to Terry and Amy in Waco. For all things True Crime Garage, go to truecrimegarage.com, check out our blog for case discussion, and check out the store page to get one of our many True Crime Garage shirts. If you'd like to listen to our early episodes, episode one to now, you can check that out on the Stitcher app, exclusively on the Stitcher app. If you'd like to check out our show off the record, it's our other weekly show where we give updates on other cases. We kind of talk about behind the scenes stuff in the garage. You can find that at Stitcher Premium dot com slash true crime garage that's enough of the business everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Joshua Ryan made the following statement during a U.S. District Court hearing in San Diego in 2005. The first time I met Kevin Cooper, I was eight years old, and he slit my throat. He hit me with a hatchet and put a hole in my skull. He stabbed me twice, which broke my ribs and collapsed one lung. I lived only because I stuck four fingers in my neck to slow the bleeding but I was too weak to move. I laid there for 11 hours, looking at my mother, who was right beside me. I know now he came through the sliding glass door and attacked my dad first. He was lying on the bed and was struck in the dark without warning with the hatchet and a knife. He was hit many times because there was a lot of blood on the wall and on his side of the bed. My mother screamed, and Cooper came around the bed and started hitting her. Somehow my dad was able to struggle between the bed and the closet, but Cooper bludgeoned my father to death with the knife and hatchet, stabbing him 26 times and axing him 11. One of the blows severed his finger, and it landed in the closet. My mother tried to get away, but he caught her at the bottom of the bed and he stabbed her 25 times and axed her seven. All of us kids were drawn to the room by my mom's screams. Jessica was killed in the doorway with five axe blows and 46 stabs. I won't say how many times my best friend Chris was stabbed and axed, not because it's not important, but because I don't want to hurt his family in any way, and they are here. After Cooper killed everyone and thought he had killed me, he went over to my sister and lifted her shirt and drew things on her stomach with the knife. Then he walked down the hallway, opened the refrigerator, and had a beer. I guess killing so many people can make a man thirsty.
Franklin Douglas Ryan grew up on the outskirts of Des Moines, Iowa. He grew up to be tall, strong, and a well-liked man. He became a Marine and then went on to be an MP, a uh, military police officer. By the way, he went by the name Doug, so we will just call him Doug. Uh, Peggy Ann Ryan was born Peggy Ann Howell. She got her first of many horses that she would own in her lifetime when she was just 12 years old. Horses were her passion, and she would be gifted several horses from her twice-divorced mother. This is Dr. Mary Howell. Peggy was always strong and athletic, and she grew up to be 5 foot 8 inches tall. Peggy loved to train horses and enter them in competitions. Uh, this is near her mother's chiropractic practice in Pennsylvania, not far from Lancaster. As a teen, she aspired to become a veterinarian, but her mother persuaded her to follow in her footsteps. So just like her mother, Peggy attended the Palmer School of Chiropractics in Davenport, Iowa. She graduated in 1963, and then she went to work for her mother at the chiropractic clinic that she owned located in Santa Ana. Three and a half years later, Peggy ventured out on her own, opening up her own clinic in Santa Ana. And in 1970, Peggy Ann met Doug Ryan at an alumni reunion at Palmer. And not too much later, the two were married at a church in Corona del Mar. Yeah, they'd be married December 20th, 1970. Eventually, the two newlyweds decided to open up their own practice together. This is in Olympia, Washington. After relocating, Peggy bought two horses. While it turns out that Olympia was not a great spot for the couple as far as their chiropractic business mm -hmm. or their equestrian hobby would be concerned, it was a great stop along life's big adventure for their family, though, because their daughter, Jessica Kate Ryan, was born in Olympia on November 9th, 1972. So their practice is failing at this point. The Ryans accepted Peggy's mother's offer to join her successful and very lucrative chiropractic clinic back in Santa Ana. This is in the mid uh, 1973. So the Ryans bought a home in Santa Ana. This is with a big backyard, big enough to hold their two horses. And they continued to purchase more horses. Now, Captain, I'm not certain here, but I think at some point they got up to like five or six horses in their backyard. That's a lot of horse shit. <laughs> well, the neighbors mm -hmm. are going to start complaining about all these horses, about them keeping them in their backyard. Probably because of the smell. Well, this would be this would prompt the eventual move to Chino Hills, California. So they find a hilltop ranch. This is directly above Peggy's mother's house in Chino Hills. It came on the market. Mm -hmm. Doug and Peggy Ryan sold their home in Santa Ana, and they bought this new house. Now, Peggy noted to friends that the property came with a gorgeous barn and a huge riding ring. The three-bedroom, two-bath house featured a sunken living room and a family room and a jacuzzi in the patio off of the master bedroom. Mmm, jacuzzi. So this secluded area of Chino Hills that Doug and Peggy Ryan uh, moved into with their two-year-old daughter, Jessica, and their infant son, Joshua. This fulfilled a long-held dream for Peggy Ryan, joining a small, close-knit community. This is all... This, the community is of Arabian horse breeders who operated adjoining or close-by ranches. So this is horse people moving to be near other horse people. I think they're called centaurs. Their neighbors referred to their ranches along Old English Road as the Arabian Horse Center of Southern California. From their hilltop house, the Ryans looked out over a maze of white fences and their neighbors' ranches. In the Ryan stables were more than a dozen white Arabian show horses. The house was located at 2943 English Place, Chino Hills, California, and unfortunately, it was going to be the location of a set of horrid murders. Saturday, June 4th, 1983. By now, the Ryan's daughter, Jessica, was 10 years old, and their son, Josh, was 8 years old. Mm -hmm. There were not many boys in this neighborhood, the same age as Josh, but there was one boy who had become very good friends with Josh, and this is 11-year-old Chris Hughes. Chris and Josh had gone trick-or-treating together, they were very close. Christopher Hughes was almost five foot tall, and he had just completed the fifth grade. 
Christopher was a good student. He had lots of friends. He was on the swim team, and he had a room full of trophies to prove it. He liked Star Wars, and on this Saturday, after an invite from his friend Josh, he begged his mother that he be allowed to stay the night at the Ryan's family home. She agreed, but told Christopher to remember that he needed to be home in time in the morning for church. Christopher's mother watched the two boys ride away on their bicycles toward Josh's home. Now that evening, the Ryans with their guest, Christopher, they attended a potluck dinner with about a hundred other equestrian enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. That's hard to say. Equestrian enthusiasts and their (laughs) families and their families at the Chino Hill home of George and Valerie blade. This was a pretty big party. Yeah. And again, all horse people. It was a BYOB affair. They arrived to the gathering with a bottle of pink Chablis. That night at the party, the Blade's son, Jason, pleaded with his parents to allow him to stay the night as well at the Ryan's home. But he was not allowed to because I guess like their grandmother was in town and visiting. Right. So around 9.30 p.m., the Ryan's and Chris returned to the Ryan split level home. After a while, the children went to sleep. The boys were sleeping in sleeping bags on the floor in Josh's room. And Jessica was in her room. Uh, Doug Ryan watched some television before joining his wife in bed, probably about 11 PM. So we have just a real quick recap. We have the father, the mother, the daughter, which is older. And then we have the son and then his friend. Yeah, so the daughter, Jessica, would be 10 years old. Right. Josh is 8 years old, and his friend, Christopher, is 11. The next morning, Christopher's mother, Mary Ann Hughes, she became concerned because, remember, he's supposed to come home so they can go to church in the morning. He doesn't come home. So Mm -hmm. she called the Ryan residence a few times but only got busy signals. So shortly after 9 a.m., Mrs. Hughes went to the Ryan home. She noticed that the barn was closed and it didn't look to her like the horses had been fed or let out or whatever it is you're supposed to do with horses. I, I'm not going to pretend to know what, <laughs> what well, let's to, just assume that they need to be fed in the morning. I have dogs. Mm-hmm. I feed them and let them out in the morning. So I, I'm guessing horses are the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is her account of the, um, situation that the barn looked to have been closed. No activity that morning that she could see. Uh, She only saw the Ryan's truck at the house. They had a station wagon as well, but she did not see the station wagon. She knocked on the door several times. There was no answer. At about 1130 a.m., Mr. Hughes went to the Ryan home to investigate. And Mr. Hughes went to the kitchen door, looked inside, tried the door, but it was locked. He continued around the outside of the house until he reached the sliding glass door leading to the Ryan's master bedroom. He looked inside the glass door and he saw the body of his son. He also saw the bodies of uh, Doug and Peggy Ryan Mm -hmm. and Josh Ryan lying on the floor between his mother and Christopher. Now, apparently when this is happening, Mm -hmm. so Mr. Hughes is trying to get into this sliding glass door. He, He can't get into the door. He can see Josh in there and Josh kind of moves. He's the only body that he sees move inside. And he's trying to tell Josh, I need you to get up and unlock this door. Yeah. But we would later learn Josh has sustained too many injuries. He, he can't get up. Eventually, Mr. Hughes goes around to another door. This is back to the door that's at the kitchen and he, he kicks in the door. And then he goes inside and he finds he finds the bodies of of all five of these people. Right. Now, four of them are dead including his son. And he finds Josh who is very bloodied and very weak. So he starts asking or trying to ask Josh, "Hey, who did this?" But Josh's throat has been slit, right? Mm-hmm. So he can't tell him. Yeah, he tries to talk but he he's like only moving his lips. There's nothing coming out. Mr. Hughes tried to use the phone, the telephone in the house to call for help, but the phone did not work. So he had to drive to a neighbor's house seeking help. 
The police arrived and Doug, Peggy, Chris, and Jessica were pronounced dead. Josh was found lying on his side. His eyes were open, but he was unable to speak or move. He was unresponsive. Josh was flown by helicopter to Loma Linda University Hospital, and thankfully Josh would survive. Now, we're going to go through the medical examiner's findings. This is going to be, this will be difficult to hear, so some of you may want to skip forward a few minutes. Because um, we're going to turn down the volume of the mics. <laughs> uh, well, this is going to be gruesome stuff oh. here. Uh, so, Doug Ryan suffered at least 37 separate wounds. Some inflicted by an axe or hatchet, and some were stab wounds. This is the father. Yes. Five chop wounds to Mr. Ryan's skull were in a, quote, tight pattern, indicating his skull was stationary when the blows were delivered. The blows appeared to have been administered in rapid succession within a second or two, as Mr. Ryan was kneeling by the side of the bed. One blow administered to Mr. Ryan's skull was consistent with being struck by the blunt side of a hatchet or axe, causing a depressed skull fracture where the bone was pushed into his head. Mr. Ryan's right middle finger was amputated by a chopping blow. His severed finger was found on the floor inside the Ryan's bedroom closet. Mm. Another chop wound cut clear through the bone of his right forearm. One stab wound penetrated his sternum, entering his heart. One stab wound punctured his lung. There were slicing injuries to the right side of Mr. Ryan's cheek, and before he died, Mr. Ryan was stabbed on the left side of his neck, severing his carotid artery and cutting his trachea. So before we move on, real quick what that means is we're seeing obvious signs of defensive wounds here. Right. So he's attacked. Presumably they're surprised in the middle of the night, but he is able to at least get up and attempt to defend himself. And I say that I believe that these are defensive wounds because we're seeing a lo- several wounds to his hands and his forearms, almost as if he's putting them up in defense of himself. Mm-hmm. Now, the one thing that I think is important here, too, is the the wounds to his skull, which they titled as a tight pattern, would almost indicate that they are made in rapid succession by the same person, by the same hand, same weapon, same individual inflicting these wounds. Mm-hmm. Peggy Ryan suffered 32 separate identified wounds. These wounds were primarily on her head, chest, and neck areas. A series of three chopping wounds to the right side of Mrs. Ryan's head were consistent with having been administered while she was standing. Mrs. Ryan had a defensive wound on her right hand. Jessica Ryan, the daughter, suffered 46 separate identified wounds consisting of a combination of chopping and stabbing or incision wounds. Jessica suffered a stab wound to her neck. The wound resulted in massive bleeding. Unconsciousness from this wound due to rapid blood loss would have occurred in as little as 30 to 60 seconds and would have been fatal in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Three stab wounds to Jessica's chest were near each other, suggesting the wounds were delivered in rapid succession. The wounds were consistent with having been delivered while Jessica was in the position in which she was found. Jessica suffered a grouping of carving injuries on her chest. Most apparently occurred after Jessica had stopped bleeding. So after she had already passed so postmortem. Yes. The injuries were consistent with a, an ice pick, a nail or an awl having been used to inflict these injuries. These injuries were primarily inflicted while Jessica was in the position in which she was found, the position in which she died. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a little more information here. It looks like she suffered early on in the attack. She suffered a wound that was great enough, powerful enough for her to be knocked unconscious because of the rapid blood loss, Mm -hmm. which she would die from that. So a lot of these wounds that she suffered we can assume where she suffered these wounds after she was already passing away as she was dying as she was unconscious. So she's, we're not going to see as many defensive wounds on her because she didn't have the opportunity, the chance to defend herself. Right now, 
one thing that I think is interesting here, though, Captain, is we are seeing the suggestion of a possible third weapon being used here. So some of these injuries and wounds, the medical examiner is suggesting were produced by a knife. Mm -hmm. And then we have other wounds that he's suggesting were produced by a hatchet or an ax. And then we have wounds to the girl that suggests that they were, they were created by an ice pick or a nail, something to that effect, but different from the knife and the hatchet. Right now, Christopher Hughes suffered 25 separate wounds. A chopping wound to his right wrist went through the bone of his forearm, almost severing his hand from his wrist. Chris also suffered a chopping injury to his right hand. The injuries were consistent with defensive wounds. Several of Christopher's wounds were inflicted after the boy had passed. Joshua Ryan, the little boy that somehow survived his injuries, included including a hatchet wound to the top of his head, a stab wound to his throat, and a hatchet wound near his left ear. Now, the coroner, this is Dr. Root, who performed the autopsies, believed that the injuries could have been inflicted quickly, within one minute for each of the victims. He suspected each victim died within minutes of being attacked. Our survivor will be able to report his limited memory of the murders. Mm -hmm. This is a breakdown of Josh's eyewitness report immediately after his rescue. There was a clinical social worker at the hospital that interviewed the boy that afternoon in the emergency room. Josh was unable to speak. He pointed at words and numbers on this chart that were provided to him by the social worker. Right. He's going to use this method to try to tell the social worker what had happened, what he had witnessed during the attack. Most importantly, what he points out is that three white men were in the house at the time of the attacks. Well, and like you said, the coroner thinks that these attacks happen within a minute of each other. Mm -hmm. So that would be one individual moving pretty rapidly. Or suggesting that there's more than one attacker. Right. So... The, the social worker says, you know, I asked Josh how many people were there, and Josh pointed to the number three. He said, I asked him if, if they were male. He pointed to yes. Yeah, now, I don't want to say that you're wrong, but I, I do believe that when they said um, how many people were there that he actually pointed to three and four. I mean, that's just what I heard. He also asked the boy if the men were black. And Josh pointed to the word no. So this man added that Josh said that he had seen the men before, but did not know them. Now let's add this fact in here. So we have San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputy. This is Irvin Dale Sharp. He would later testify that he interviewed the boy twice on June 5th, the same day. Sharp said that the first interview took place in the emergency room and lasted about 15 minutes. In that interview, Josh Josh said that three white men were in the house when the killings occurred. But in a subsequent interview, this is an hour later, the boy identified the three men as possibly Hispanic, each between 18 and 20 years old, possibly driving a low rider Chevrolet Impala, and had been at his house on June 4th. Sharp later testified that the youth told him the attack on his family took place between 4 and 5 a.m. There is thought that this time frame would not have been consistent with the coroner's finding. Well, he's eight years old, right? Right. And then on top of that, he's been, he has a head wound and a severe, you know, slashing of his throat. Mm Mm-hmm but I just wonder how much the head wound is causing these inaccuracies. Well, here, here's the other thing too, you know, so the coroner's finding the coroner suspects that the attacks likely took place a couple hours earlier than what Josh is saying. He believes the attacks took place three weeks after the slayings. The boy was released from the university medical center and left for the East coast where he was, going to be staying with his uncle. Now, later, a custody of Josh would be granted to his grandmother, Dr. Mary Howell. (music) 
All right, we're back. Cheers, me mateys. Well, Captain, I think we should probably introduce Kevin Cooper to everybody. And, you know, we have the situation here where we've titled this episode Kevin Cooper. And other than Joshua's statement to the court, we've not heard his name yet. And this case puts us in a difficult situation, doesn't it, Captain? Because we usually try to title these episodes uh, the victim's name Mm -hmm. because the victims are often forgotten about in these true crime stories. Here we have Kevin Cooper, who, as you heard Josh's statement, he says killed my family. But the reason why we title it Kevin Cooper is there is some question about this man's guilt. And what we really wanted to present to everybody is the facts of the case. So everybody can, form their own opinion. Is Kevin Cooper guilty of having killed this family? And after reviewing all of the evidence and after looking at this story, you presented this case to me and I had not heard of this case, which I found a little weird because once I started diving into it, it seems to be a fairly popular case, uh, especially in the California area. But after you told me about this case and we're looking into it, you know, what kept running through my mind is this is, you know, the, the famous show making a murderer. Mm-hmm. This, this sh- should have been, a, this should have been about Kevin Cooper. Um, <laughs> and I know I'm not going to, uh, win a lot of people over with this statement, but looking at this case, um, I, I think one could present evidence to look, Stephen Avery looks a lot more guilty to me than Kevin Cooper, but okay, let's go through. Let's introduce Kevin Cooper, and then we will try to get to some of the evidence here, Captain. So Kevin Cooper was adopted as a baby. He suffered an abusive and troubled childhood in Pennsylvania. He would run away from home at a very young age. Later, he said that this was to escape beatings. The trouble he got into as a child involved shoplifting and marijuana charges. He never graduated from high school. Uh, Kevin Cooper really got into trouble. This was in Pennsylvania when he stole a car from a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. Now, apparently, apparently the girl interrupted him while he was committing this. um, He was committing some form of residential burglary. Okay. She interrupts him committing this crime. He then steals the car, but he, he also took the girl with him. And Kevin Cooper would later admit forcing the 17-year-old girl into the vehicle. Now, she says that he also hit her, he threatened her, he threatened to kill her, and that he had raped her. Hmm. He flatly denies hitting or raping her. Do we have any evidence of this? Um, I don't know. All I have is his statement where he admits to stealing the car and forcing her into the vehicle. I think this is a he-said-she-said situation. I don't think there was a lot of evidence to point either direction. And then you have a guy that is willing to admit to some of the charges, uh, you know, right. Unfortunately, I think probably should have been charged with kidnapping a minor, but regardless of the charges, he is going to do time for this. Cooper would also be arrested, charged and convicted several times. Uh, these are for theft related offenses. He escaped from custody in Pennsylvania numerous times. Then he goes to California. In California, Cooper is arrested, charged, and sentenced to state prison for two counts of residential burglary. Now, how old is he at this time? Um, Well, this would have been in 1982. Mm -hmm. And this is is in Los Angeles County. Cooper lied about his identity, uh, his background, and his criminal history by using the false name of David Troutman. Now, on June 1st of 1983, Cooper was transferred to a minimum security portion of the prison in which he was being housed. Two days before the murders, he escaped on foot from the California Institute for Men. Well, so I just want to get this clear. He's actually serving a sentence, a four-year sentence, but under the name David Troutman. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that, he, that's he, interesting. he lied about his identity and this, it would make him appear. So he got a pretty light sentence and that being because of two things. He lies about his identity because he's escaped from prison in 
Pennsylvania one. Right. And mm-hmm. he has a lengthy criminal history of, of these, you know, some, most of these are pretty minor charges, but he has a lengthy criminal history where he probably would have faced considerable more amount of time there. Right. And he's, he's then shipped off to this minimum security portion of the prison. This is when he escapes from prison. And it's just a couple days before this family is found murdered. So when he escapes from prison, I mean, this is just, he just kind of walks through a field, like runs away from a group of people or something. Do we have much information on this? Well, okay. And this is why I say that this is the case that should have been featured on making a murder. Not because I'm, you know, that's not a spoiler alert where I think that Kevin Cooper is innocent. What I mean by that is the problem with this case. And when you try to research this case, is it gets presented in some different lights and it depends on who you're getting your information from, because there are some people out there that are pretty hardcore that Kevin Cooper is innocent. There's some other people on the opposite side of the fence that he's very guilty. And then there's some people, and these are the ones that I don't like to get any information from because I don't feel that I can trust it. There are some people that I believe that are just so much against the death penalty And because Kevin Cooper would eventually be on death row for these murders, I think that they skew the information a little bit. So some people would have you believe that his escape from this prison is as simple as he finds a hole in the fence. He walks up to it. He goes through the hole and walks away. Peace out. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, The hole in the fence portion seems to be pretty true. What doesn't seem to be true is that he just kind of, you know, moseyed on down the road and, and walked to Chino Hills. Right. The, the reality is that he did climb through this hole in the fence, but he goes and he hides out in some like lumber yard Mm -hmm. and he waits for the sun to go down because he's going to need to flee after dark, he doesn't want to be seen. And mind you, he's wearing all of his prison garb. He looks like somebody that just walked out of the prison. Right. So he he's going to wait till till sundown, and during the cover of darkness, he's going to go to this Chino uh, Chino Hills. Sorry, and he finds this vacant house. This house is owned by a couple of people, uh, Larry Lease. And these brothers, Roger and Kermit Lang, own this house. Now, some of the information out there will refer to this home as an abandoned house. This could not be further from the truth. This was a home that was being used. These men would use this home. This home was completely outfitted. And they actually rented it out from time to time. So this was not an abandoned house. He happened to find a home that was empty. You know, had no, no people staying in it. Right. And he decides to stay there and make it his hideout. So we'll refer to it as the hideout house because that's kind of what it is. He's on the run from the law and he's hiding out at this house while he's there. You know, he's doing typical things that you would do throughout your day. He's, you know, using the restroom, uh, taking a shower. He did say that he slept that night, the first night in one of the beds. However, all of the bedrooms have windows. He was concerned that somebody would see him through one of the windows. So he started sleeping inside the closet of the bedroom while he was there. He was, you know, he found beer and other things to drink while he was there. He, he was smoking cigarettes. Now the key thing about this house though, this house is down the hill and it's actually nearest to the Ryan house, right? This is just 126 yards away. Now, that should give you some idea of what kind of neighborhood we're dealing with. This is the nearest home, and it's more than a football field away. Yeah, but not much more than a football field. So Cooper slept in the closet of the bedroom of a bedroom that was nearest the garage. There was a window by a fireplace inside this home. And that that window from that window, you could get a very good view of the Ryan home. The house had two telephones and Cooper called Yolanda Jackson and Diane Williams from the house, asking them for help. These are old friends of his. 
they both decline. Now, the telephone records would later show that the two calls, that two calls were made from the house Mm -hmm. to the uh, Los Angeles area telephone number of Yolanda Jackson. The first call lasted 110 minutes. Must have been a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, This beginning on June 3rd at 1217 a.m. And the second call lasted four minutes beginning at 226 a.m. the same morning. Two calls were also made from the house to Diane Williams, who was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The first call lasted three minutes beginning on June 3rd at 11.46 a.m., and the second lasted 34 minutes beginning on June 4th at 7.53 p.m. Diane Williams told Cooper that she did not have any money that she could give him. Now, according to Cooper, he decided to leave the house after this phone call. The final call was only an hour or so before the Ryans and Chris Hughes left the Blade House from that potluck dinner. Right, the party. To return to their home. Mm. Okay, so there are there's some documents out there. There's websites out there dedicated to this case. And a lot of times they spend a lot of time presenting evidence that, that Cooper was staying at the home before the murders. I think that's a big waste of everybody's time. He admits to staying at the home before the murder. There's no question about that. Right. So we don't need to pour through that evidence. We have enough evidence in these actual murders that we're going to have to pour through. So what you're saying is according to Cooper, he was at the house. So there is no debating that. Yeah, we we won't debate that. According to his own words, he was at this home nearest the murder house. But about that, but that doesn't mean that you were the murderer. Well, correct. But right. according to his own words, he was there and left about eight, sometime between eight and eight thirty that night. The Ryans would have returned to their home around nine thirty to ten o'clock that night, then going to bed and being attacked and murdered sometime during that night. So question, where is Cooper going? Cooper says that he had planned all along to go to Mexico. And this might be the truth because we know that Cooper checked into a hotel in Tijuana. This is around 4 p.m. on Sunday, June 5th, 1983, using the false name of Angel Jackson. (laughs) So from Tijuana, Cooper made his way to Ensenada, Mexico, where on June 9th, he met Owen and Angelica Handy. He introduced himself as Angel Jackson, and he asked them for a job. He was going to go work for them on their boat. The Handys then set sail for San Francisco, and Cooper, posing as Angel Jackson, went with them. During this time, the Handys saw Cooper in possession of numerous items, later identified as having been taken from the vacant house nearest the Ryan's home. They stopped at various places along their way to San Francisco. Cooper stayed on the boat. So when, when the Handys would... Park the boat. They would they would get dock the boat. I guess you should say. Yeah, yeah. They would get off the boat. They would go on shore. They probably presumably going out to eat, shopping, whatever they're doing. He does not get off the boat at any of these stops. Mm-hmm. He's laying low. Let's say. I'm then, on a boat. Then they decide to go to Santa Barbara for like three, maybe four days. On July thirtieth, nineteen eighty three. Uh, Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department responded to a call for assistance of an attempted rape on a boat that was docked next to the Handys boat in Pelican Pelican Cove. The 26-year-old female victim reported that a man she identified as Kevin Cooper attempted to rape her at knife point. Cooper tried to flee when the authorities came to the dock to arrest him. The sheriffs observed Cooper throw an object into the water before he dove off the Handy's boat, swam to a dinghy, and started to row for shore. The sheriffs recovered a knife from the water where Cooper attempted his unsuccessful escape. He was arrested. So let's break this down very quickly, because if if you pour over every single minute detail, we're going to be here for days. So a summary of what what we've covered, well, you're saying I smell? No, you smell fine. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Thank you. There's not a whole lot of ammo in the garage fridge, if you know what I mean. All right. So let's break down what we've covered so far. 
Four people are murdered in the middle of the night inside the Ryan home. One little boy, eight-year-old Josh. He survives. Survives. He gives a description of three men, all either Caucasian or maybe Hispanic, Mm -hmm. as being in the home during the murders. Police would later learn that an escaped convict, Kevin Cooper, was hiding out in the home nearest the murder house for two days leading up to the murders. He says he fled to Mexico, and law enforcement is going to say, yes, he fled to Mexico, but before he did that, he killed those four people. Mm. Well, why did he do that? What's his motive? Well, he's an escaped convict. He needs to steal money and their car to get out of Dodge. So we know the car was stolen. Now there's been, this is, this is one thing that you and I've spoke about multiple times on this show. There are so every report I've come across never mentions anything being stolen from the Ryan home. Nothing ever mentions, you know, in fact, there's some reports that state outwardly state nothing was taken from the home. Mm -hmm. We know the car was taken, but you and I've, like I said, We've talked about this before. Unless you have a running inventory of everything inside the home, I don't know that we can say with certainty that nothing was stolen from the home. That's right. I mean, if these, if one, if the husband or wife came home with five hundred dollars cash in their purse or pocket that day, it, it, we wouldn't know that. Yeah, but and also think about how many times you come in the garage every week, and guitars come in and out, and instruments coming in and out. You probably noticed it sometimes, but you couldn't tell me what was different. No, you, exactly. And that, that's what I think. I don't think anybody can point out with 100% certainty that nothing was stolen from the home. I completely agree with you. Now, what about the car? We know the car was stolen. Where was the car found? The car was eventually found in Long Beach, California. So if you went Long Beach, California, and then on to Tijuana, it's a little more than four and a half hours by car from the murder house. So this actually leaves enough time for Cooper to commit the murders, drive to Long Beach, and then escape to Mexico and still check into the hotel on June 5th at 4 p.m. So you're saying there's a chance. Well, we also need to discuss quickly how the police got on to Cooper because we have a weird situation here, Captain, don't we, where... This situation, they they are looking for Kevin Cooper. It's right. not like he's arrested for this attempted rape charge and then they back into evidence pointing that he committed these murders. What actually well, would happen? Go well, ahead. Hold on. Technically, they're looking for David Troutman. Looking for Kevin Cooper using the alias, possibly using the alias of Troutman. The thing here, though, what's weird is they kind of they find some evidence to back into this thought that Kevin Cooper's the one that committed these murders. And it's it might be considered loosey goosey. But like we talked about, what is a coincidence when we're talking about these cases? Is it evidence or is it coincidence? Right. So the situation is this. They find a bloody footprint, bloody shoe print, I should say, at the home at the murder scene. Mm -hmm. This is believed to be from a type of shoe called a pro head. Now at this vacant home nearest the Ryan's house, Mm -hmm. they find loose tobacco and it's believed that this was roll right brand tobacco. Well, why is that significant? It's significant because this is the type of tobacco that was given out for free to inmates of the prisons at the time. The way that the system was set up back then was this. If you had money in your account, you could buy whatever brand of cigarettes you preferred to smoke. Right. But to keep, you got to keep these guys, um, orderly. You know, you don't want pure chaos there. People killing each other over cigarettes. Well, maybe we do. So what they would do is they would hand out this cheap, loose tobacco and you could roll your own cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Well, it's believed that Kevin Cooper would often roll his own cigarettes with this roll right brand of tobacco provided to him for free at the prison. So what does it have to do with the shoe print? Well, the shoe print, the pro keds were shoes that were issued to prisoners. Mm-hmm. So they have these two items that they find 
one at the crime scene, one at the what I've been calling the hideout house. There's also a question, though. Where's this one footprint found? The footprint that I there was there were several shoe prints that are discussed in this case. Mm -hmm. The one that I'm discussing right now is one that was found on a sheet inside of the home of Mm -hmm. the Ryan's home. So they have some evidence pointing them to a possible prisoner or somebody that would have, you know, would have this free tobacco from a prison would be wearing shoes that are issued at a prison. So their thought is, well, let's, let's check to see if there's any people that have been recently escaped from prison. That's where they come up with this Troutman or Cooper as their possible suspect. So they have this situation where they have they they think they're looking for the murderer and they think they know who the murderer is. They find him down uh, in Santa Barbara after this attempted a- alleged rape. alleged attempted rape. A local citizen discovered a hatchet. This was on June fifth, nineteen eighty three, on the side of English Road. This is the only paved road leading from the Ryan home out of the immediate area. The hatchet was covered with blood stains. Uh, the head of the hatchet was covered by dried blood and it had human hairs on it as well. Some of the hairs were consistent with those of Doug and Josh Ryan. Now, the Dr. Irving Root, who performed the autopsies, concluded that the hatchet could have inflicted the chopping wounds suffered by the victims. Mm-hmm. Well, It's believed that this hatchet came from the hideout house. Hmm. Why? Because like I said, those men would rent out this home and we have the previous tenant saying that, look, when I lived there and she, she moved out of there at the end of May. So literally just like what a couple days before Cooper decides to show up at at this house. Mm -hmm. She says, while I lived there, there was a hatchet that was inside this home and it matched the one, you know, the description matches the one that was found on the side of the road that has the victim's blood on it. Right. But there's a lot of houses that have a hatchet. True. And let's just point out, let's be clear. This is 1983. Let's also point out that the people that they're saying that that hatchet probably came from our place. They are white. Let's just put that out there. Okay. Um, (laughs) Anyway, this hatchet, according to her and according to the owners of the home, it was in their house before these murders took place. We also have the strange situation of the sheath that goes over the hatchet, right, Captain? Mm -hmm. So this sheath was supposedly found on the, you know, in in one of the rooms of this hideout house. Right. So, So meaning that somebody would have to take off the cover. Once they take off the cover, then they go up the hill. They create the murders as they drive down the hill in their car. They're going to toss out this hatchet on the side of the road. Correct. Correct. And that is actually going to be pretty much the law enforcement's theory on this case. The theory being this Kevin Cooper was staying at this hideout house. He decides that he needs money and a car to get him to Mexico. He decides to break into this home, and when he breaks in, he's confronted by, I I guess, the husband or the wife or somebody, and his reaction is to murder everybody in the house, and he only leaves that house after he thinks everyone is dead, not knowing that the eight-year-old boy would later survive. Right. Then he takes a beer from the fridge in the house where he killed these people, drinks the beer carries his items with him from this house where he committed these murders back to the hideout house where he's going to clean up and later take their car, dispose of the hatchet and make his way to Mexico. But first he's going to stop in long beach and dump the car. Yeah. So do we have any evidence from the car then we do? And and here's the thing though. I apologize. I think it wasn't until like five to seven days after the murders that the vehicle was located. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't find it in my, in my notes here to be certain of that. But if memory serves me correct, then it was about five to seven days after the murders that the vehicle was found in long beach inside the vehicle 
Police found loose tobacco on the front passenger seat and floorboard. Mm. They also found blood stains. And I want to, th- I'm going to throw a caveat in here, a buyer beware to everybody out there listening regarding these blood stains inside the vehicle, the Ryan's vehicle. Mm-hmm. I found reports that are all over the shop as to how much blood was found in the car and where the blood was located. Some reports state that there were uh, blood stains on the front passenger seat and on the driver's side door jam. There are also reports out there that suggest that blood stains were found in the back seat of the vehicle as well. Mm -hmm. So we have where we have one situation where the blood stains might suggest that only one person, one bloodied person stole this vehicle and moved it. There's also evidence out there that suggests that maybe more than one bloodied person was in that vehicle. Now the car did not appear to have been hot wired. This is, I included this statement because I'm uncertain if the keys were stolen for this car. Right. I'm guessing that they might be because we can, we have to believe that the person that stole this vehicle was inside the Ryan home. You know, also if you're kind of sick, secluded from people that maybe you leave your keys in your car. I mean, I've hung out with a lot of buddies that had lived on farms and stuff and they they'd never take their keys out of their car. Yeah. I, I used to know somebody that would put it on the uh, wheel. Yeah. Have you ever seen people do that? They put yeah. the, the key on the wheel. Here you go. I had a car once that, uh, congratulations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the key was so like worn down. Mm hmm. I swear you could have put any key into that ignition and it would have started. Like I, and I think I actually did that one time. I put the wrong key in and it turned over. <laughs> Still work. Yeah. Anyway, but there were two cigarette butts that were found inside the vehicle. Mm-hmm. Okay. So one of them was a hand rolled cigarette. This was found in a, in a crevice of the front passenger seat. Mm-hmm. This is the same loose, uh, believed to be roll, right brand tobacco, which is provided for free to the, C I M inmates. Right. But you could buy this tobacco just on the, like on the open market. Right. I know you couldn't according to my, now I mind you, I didn't smoke cigarettes back in 1983 or live in California. So mm-hmm. I couldn't tell or you roll cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't tell you with certainty, but from what I found is this roll, right? Tobacco was provided for free to the inmates and not available for retail. How would they know what kind of brand of tobacco it would be? Uh, I, okay. In all honesty, we have a lot of people that would testify later in court that it appears to be this roll right brand of tobacco. Mm-hmm. I got to be honest with you, Captain. I don't know how they would know that. I, I don't know how they I would know that for certain. Way. I don't. I mean, if you take, if I gave you three bags of loose tobacco you're not going to know which one is which well and what i mean by that too not just if you gave it to me because i i don't don't know tobacco very well anyway Mm -hmm. but i'm saying if you gave it to somebody that worked at a manufacturing plant which these are the types of people that testified at court Mm -hmm. i think if you gave them if we broke open three cigarettes right now or bought three different kinds of loose leaf tobacco Mm -hmm. Like you said, put them in different baggies and handed them to them. They're taking the Pepsi challenge and they don't pass that test. I don't see how they would identify those to be anything other than loose tobacco. Right. But I think that's the key here is you go, okay, we don't need to go to the fine, you know, ballpoint pin, right? Mm -hmm. We just need to, we need to have a marker line, right? So we just need to go, Hey, we have a loose tobacco. Mm-hmm. Now, in 1983, there's probably more people rolling cigarettes than they are now or was at the height of when people smoked. But it's still important because that's a very small, it's a lot smaller percentage. Well, and then you have another issue here, too. They also found a manufactured cigarette butt was found in the front passenger seat of the car. So, mm-hmm. so what we do know is we have a smoker. Yes, and... How do we know that those cigarettes came from the person that stole the car? We don't. We, we don't know that for certain. We, and we can get into these cigarette butts more later. 
But the law enforcement is going to have an answer for this because here again, just like with the blood stains in the car, Captain, that you could present an argument that it was one bloodied perpetrator that was inside that car or it was multiple bloodied perpetrators that was inside that car. The two having two different types of cigarettes found in the vehicle might suggest more than one person Mm -hmm. having been in the vehicle. The problem with this though, is we have Kevin Cooper who admittedly stayed at this hideout house. Well, the owner of the, the Mr. Lease, who is one of the owners of the home Mm -hmm. said that he would leave Viceroy brand cigarettes in that house and that they were gone after Cooper had apparently stayed there. Right. So, you have this thing where maybe he smoked some of that loose tobacco that he brought with him from the prison when he escaped. Mm -hmm. And did he steal the Viceroy cigarettes while he was at the house? If that's the case, that could explain a way that we don't have two different people smoking two different kinds of cigarettes. We have one individual just smoking whatever he can get his hands on at the time. Well, and if you have a bloody individual that goes inside the passenger seat, goes into the driver's seat, goes into the back seat, And that's going to make it seem like there's maybe possibly more than one individual as well. While we are on the topic of the cigarettes found in the vehicle, Captain, I do want to point out that several tests were conducted on these cigarette butts. So we have saliva tests on the two cigarette butts in the Ryan station wagon. These results were consistent with cigarettes having been smoked by a non-secretor, which we do know Kevin Cooper is a non-secretor. Only about 20% of the population are non-secretors. This doesn't mean that it was exactly him. So what the heck does that mean? It just means that he is he has similar makeup to the person that did smoke these cigarettes. Now, the blood type of the person who smoked the manufactured cigarette that was found was determined to be type A, which is also consistent with Kevin Cooper's blood type. Mm-hmm. But now that we have DNA, why haven't we tested these items? That's a good question. Um, Because it it still doesn't prove the murder, but at least it proves um, him inside their car. Well, no, I don't think that it does. Um, Oh, you mean if it were tested for DNA? Right. I just meant with the evidence that we currently have. What I think is interesting about this evidence, though, that they present here. It doesn't specifically name Kevin Cooper as the person who smoked those cigarettes and left them inside the Ryan station wagon, Mm -hmm. but neither test excludes him from being that person either. We got a ton more to get to. Please join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.